Well, good evening and welcome back to the Journey Home program. I'm your host, John Mark Grodi, here on EWTN. And once again, we have this opportunity to hear a story, a conversion story. We're joined tonight by Rachel Bullman. She's former Church of God, and her website is rachelbullman.com. She's also the co-host, uh, we'll hear more about this later, but of Meet the Bullmans from Word on Fire. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm excited to hear more about that project. But thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you so tonight, much. Rachel. I've been looking forward to meeting for a while. We actually had essays in a book by Dr. Peter Kreeft mm -hmm. a couple years ago, and so we connected on social media about that. But I'm um, glad to finally have you here. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. This is a joy. You guys are doing some great work, so yeah. thank well, you. Well, this is... I mean, this is your story, but that, the, the power of story, um, that's, we need a balance. I mean, we're going to talk more later about your work, uh, philosophy, theology. We need a balance between all that kind of stuff, but right. also seeing how all that plays out in a person's life, you sure. know, how the gospel takes root. And so that's what, that's what we're doing here initially, and then we'll get on to the other stuff later. So I'll invite you to go way back. Where does your <laughs> story begin? Oh man, so it's so funny when people say start at the beginning, because I really do have to start at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. So I was actually born in the Philippines, <laughs> and my mother gave birth to me in a cardboard box in an alley. Wow. So she was hemorrhaging really badly, I guess. There was a big commotion, and some missionaries happened to be walking by, and they took me to the orphanage to be cared for and took her to the hospital. And so that was in November. But I guess a few months before that, my mom told me it was September and they were missionaries. And so they were actually going to the Philippines to help with like tent revivals. Wow. And so my dad would put up the tents and they would have these huge revivals. There are hundreds of people and assemblies of God, right? assemblies of yeah, God. Okay. And so she is washing the dishes. And so she had just had a miscarriage not so long before that, had mm -hmm. my two brothers and just said, Lord, I'd really like a little girl for Christmas. And so fast forward, it's November. I'm born in this alley. I'm in an orphanage. My, my biological mother got better and she came back to take care of me, but couldn't. And mm -hmm. so she ended up going back to the orphanage and saying, I can't, I can't care for her. Is there someone that might be willing to take her? And they knew that there was this couple from America that really wanted mm -hmm. to have a little girl. Mm -hmm. And so they came and went to my parents and said, what do, what do you guys think? And so my mom was, she refused to do it. She's like, I don't want to go and see her because what if this doesn't work out? This just is, I mean, you go and told my dad to go. And so my dad went to the orphanage and met me mm -hmm. and then went back to her and said, this is our little girl. Oh. And so that was, you know, I think that story just really, it's, it's incredible to think that mm -hmm. from the other side of the world, you know, mm -hmm. that I was brought here. And so then I just grew up in Assemblies of God. And so when my dad was doing mission work over there, which he was over there for, for 10 years. And so they're Anglo and he, but he ended up learning Tagalog fluently. Mm -hmm. And while he was there, he experienced a call to become a pastor. And so was ordained and was a pastor. So I grew up as the missionary's kid and the pastor's kid and like singing in church, you know, and, and doing all of those things. And I remember just thinking like, this is, this is what my life is going to be like. My, I'm one day, I'm going to be a pastor's wife yeah. and I'm going to sing and he's going to preach. And this is, this is where we're going. And it wasn't until I was probably 16, maybe a friend of mine from work said, I really want you to meet this guy that I have a crush on. I said, okay, so let's go. So we go and it was at a church. It was like a youth night at church. And I remember I was sitting in the very back and you know, in the church of God, there is a lot of a concentration, of course, during the worship service. You have the music that begins. You have so, sometimes there's several pastors that all have different messages. They have the message that's the beginning of the, the service. They have the message that's for offering. And then at this point, they had had a few songs and during the songs you were invited of course to go up and sit at the at the steps at the altar there and and pray and so i looked up and there were a bunch of teenagers and it was the first time that i think i'd ever really seen that hmm. and so i was sitting in the back and i was just like what is going on <laughs> like what's down there and so i look up in there and they're crying and i mean i felt the holy spirit you know like you whatever is happening down there like i want that for myself even growing up in a very devoutly Christian home, I had never really experienced something like that. Mm -hmm. And so from then on, it became doing things with that youth group. I mean, I grew up, I think, in that youth group. And so from then doing music and started to sing and 
I just fell in love with with the Lord during that time. But it was also during the same era as a, I don't know if you're like the whole purity movement, like the yeah. the true love waits sure. and um, Rebecca St. James mm -hmm. and this whole like you're going to sign the promise card and all those things. And so during that time, that was also formative for me. And it, I, I think I grew kind of a, um, I didn't, I didn't understand the human person at all during that time. Any kind of affection then was weird for me because I signed this card. So if I true love waits, like I can't hug or anything. Right. And that was also when that book came out, the, the dating book, Joshua Harris, the one about oh, kiss dating goodbye. Yes. Yeah. I kissed dating goodbye, which I devoured yeah. and loved and looking back, I'm like, that wasn't so good, <laughs> but that was all during this time and go into college. And during college, I continued to go down this same route. But during this time, there were a lot of different steps. You know, my, my brothers used to joke, Rachel's, if the church is open, it doesn't matter what denomination it is, Rachel's going to be there. So I was in leadership, like at a Nazarene church doing young adults. I was at Assemblies of God church helping with young adults. I was at the Church of God. I was doing mission work with the Baptist seminary. Um, Where were you living at this time? I So... When I was in high school, I spent a good portion in North Florida. Okay. And then I also had moved down to Central Florida towards the end of high school. Gotcha. And so in between all that time, there were stops in various places. But when I lived, when I was in Central Florida and kind of had rooted there my senior year and then ended up going to college in the same area, mm. it was really just kind of, I myself probably was non-denominational by that point because I was just wherever I felt like the Lord needed me. Sure. And... When I was in college, I kind of plugged in with a group. It was called Upper Room and very small Methodist college that I was going to. Mm -hmm. And I remember just, I probably would flunk out of classes because I just stay up all night reading the Bible with my friends. <laughs> I look back, I'm like, that wasn't a good stewardship, Rich. You really needed to maybe study for your classes. <laughs> but we would stay up all night long, just devouring scripture together and I just continue to fall in love with Christ and have this like personal relationship that was very much touted mm -hmm. in the way that I was growing up. Like in order for you to have salvation, it has to be very personal. And I was passionate about that. Yeah. You know, you maybe think, uh, I'm sure we'll get to it later, but you know, the, the kiss dating goodbye book and the purity culture, um, but even the, the forms of worship that you encountered, again, it's, it's interesting because it's, often easy to think of the different flavors of Christian right. denomination. That, you know, the differences aren't that big. Mm -hmm. um, and that, oh, we basically know what it means to be a Christian. But, you know, you get this trickle down from doctrine towards right. praxis in terms of, well, what does it really, yeah, what does the human person look like? You mentioned, I don't really have a concept. What, right. what is the human being? What is the person <laughs> like? And those can seem like highfalutin questions. Right. But they trickle down to how we see everyday things that we interact with, how mm -hmm. we worship, how we pray, how we... Uh, we have relationships and all that, and so they 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 seem like small things, but they're not. They're right? not the at all, right? at all. And I remember even just the worship part. Mm -hmm. I remember watching like a TD Jakes thing, and I it, him just saying, you know, you have to learn how to worship in all of these different styles. You have to know that maybe when you get to heaven, what if it's not like that? <laughs> and so I remember kind of telling myself, <laughs> I could do all that. Maybe not that chant stuff. I'm not going to do that. That's too boring. Uh, but I was really into all the different types of worship, you know, yeah. and was really called in by that. Okay. Well, we're speaking tonight with Rachel Bullman, former Church of God. Her website is rachelbullman.com. She's also the co-host of Meet the Bullmans, which we'll, we'll get into a little bit later. But you're, you're devouring scripture. You're going where Christ is calling you. You're excited. What, what happens next in that venture? So during that time, right after I graduated from college, I was working at a restaurant and then I had also was leading worship. I had become a worship pastor at a church in Tampa. And I remember at some point during that time, kind of feeling really burnt out by that. Like I was, I was doing all kinds of church ministry. It had been a huge part of just my, my whole life from being a teenager, now this time and a young adult. And, and I remember thinking like, if I can just go to any church then maybe I could just do it at home. Like maybe I don't even have to right. go anymore. Like this is, I'm kind of burnt out. And it wasn't like I hadn't lost faith in God. I, w I hadn't become atheist or agnostic. I had just decided that 
I didn't really have to practice as, as deeply as I was, you know. And so I was in the restaurant industry, you know, and you're working in the hospitality industry, there's a lot of temptation during that time. And so I remember we would get off work at like 11, 12 o'clock and, and everyone would then leave and you'd go somewhere and just drink. Mm-hmm. And so I remember just being out one night drinking and, and I was dating a lot. I was still very much called into that by, by the purity culture. So there wasn't a lot of promiscuity, but there was a whole lot of me just sharing emotionally mm-hmm. and then just breaking hearts, just just not able to commit. I'm like, not going to commit to a denomination. I'm not going to commit to any kind of real relationship with anyone. And so it was just a wild time in my life, I think. Yeah. Was was this counter, I mean, even kind of the non-denominational aspect of it, was this counter to what your parents were continuing to live? Where were they at that point? You know, they were, they had, at when I was 10 years old, my dad had actually, they had actually gotten a divorce. Oh, okay. And so he wasn't able to keep any of his ordination at that point. And, but it still didn't, it didn't sway me from sure. the love of God. Yeah. But I remember thinking, well, now I need to, to figure out where I really can find my feet planted. Sure. And even growing up in the, in the church of God, I wasn't familiar with what the real tenets of the faith were. I didn't know any of the doctrine of the church of God. I went because this is what feels good. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is where I feel like the Lord is calling me to be. And I remember when I lived in North Florida, I was going to a Baptist church with my mom. I had gotten baptized several times, you know, at this point, I got baptized in the church of God. I got baptized in the swimming pool at my dad's house. I had gotten baptized when I was Baptist. So there was really just me floating into whatever happened to be yeah. the place where I felt called at that point. And after, after college and feeling burnt out, I had gone into the non-denominational church and was doing some stuff there. But even then still, I felt like there was something that wasn't quite there yet for me. And even though, I mean, I'm like leading people in worship, doing all of these things that kind of taught me as this leader in the faith, but there was still something missing. And I remember just had hit a really low point because my mom had gotten, she had kidney disease. Mm. And so she was leaving to go and get our second kidney transplant. The second kidney had shut down. And so they were talking about whether or not they could give her another transplant. And I was in college when it all had started. And I remember just being like, Lord, why would you do all of this? Like, why would you bring me from the other side of the world into this this mess? Like, I haven't been able to find my feet in a church where I feel planted. I haven't been able to. My mom, my parents' marriage has failed. My mom is, this is probably going to be the thing that kills her. Why am I dealing with all of these things? And in this place, and never really feeling like I had an answer to that. Yeah. And so I remember just walking through with her, with her sickness. And at that point they told her, there's no, we can't do another kidney transplant. You're just gonna be on dialysis until, until the end. Mm. And so I remember going, being able to go back to the ministry that I was involved with um, in college, a lot of those friends that were still around in the area. And they just knew like, if, if your mom ever passed away, like that's gonna be a hard thing for you to face, Rachel. And I remember thinking, that might be the thing that breaks me, is my mom being mm-hmm. being taken. And so, um, and just going forward at that point after college, and I really wasn't plugged in anywhere. I had led worship for this church and then left that church for whatever reason and kind of wasn't really plugged in anywhere at that point. Okay. So. So what, uh, what changes there? What, what was the turning point? What was the next step? I had, everyone knew that I was a Christian, Mm -hmm. you know, at work. Everyone was very aware that Rachel was a Christian. She might not be inviting us to go to a church somewhere, but if you're going to get in a conversation about it, she's going to tell you that Jesus loves you. And I remember I had, was out one night at the bar and I remember looking across the bar because speed, do you remember that nineties movie with Keanu Reeves? Yeah. Yeah. Cause that's definitely bar, (laughs) like bar movie that you're going to watch. So it's up on the TV. And this guy walked underneath the TV that looked like Keanu Reeves. Mm. And I turned to my friend. I was like, that guy looks like Keanu Reeves. And she's like, uh, she's like, where? Because he had moved. <laughs> and so that guy turns out to be my husband later. Wow. But I grabbed his arm and he was like, oh, he's like, do I? He tells me that he said, do, do I know you? But I swear he said, like, why are you, why are you talking to me? Like, why are you <laughs> grabbing me in the smoky bar? 
And we ended up hanging out a little bit. And I remember going to go and meet his family because I had just gone to his his sister and I had become good friends. And I was going to go and get her and we were going to go out one night. He was studying. And when I came in and met his parents, it was the first time that I felt immediately comfortable, <laughs> just immediately at ease, that they had no expectation of me giving them anything or I didn't have to prove myself. They just loved me. And when I was leaving work one night, a young lady that I worked with, we'd always talk about the guys that we were dating, right? So I'm leaving and she goes, hey, I'm dating a new guy. I was like, yeah, me too. And I said, uh, so is the guy that she asked me, is the guy that you're dating a Christian? I said, yeah. I mean, at this point, I don't think we had even talked about our faith or anything like that, but I just knew he was a Christian. And she said, well, um, the guy that I'm dating is not a Christian. I was like, oh, she goes, yeah, he's Catholic. I was like, oh, oh. wait. <laughs> and I knew that he was also, that yeah. Jason was Catholic, my husband. And I said, so are, are Catholics not Christians? And she goes, no. And I was mm. like, well, why? Why do you think that? And she goes, I don't know. I've just heard that yeah. that's not true. And I was like, oh. And so then she said, um, what about like the mass? Have you ever been to the mass? It's weird. I was like, no, I've never been there. I said, have you been? She goes, no, I've just heard. It's weird. So it was a lot of like, I don't actually know any of these things, but I've heard that yeah. it's bad. And so. Well, what had your impression been up to that point? You know? Well, at that point, the only kind of, my family didn't, wasn't anti-Catholic, sure. but the only thing I knew about Catholicism was from the movies, <laughs> like from the Boondock Saints. Remember the Boondock Saints? I it's thought like you guys were mercenaries. That's basically day to day, yeah. you know, just normal. <laughs> right, normal. normal life. And so I didn't have a lot of exposure. Sure. And so I remember I got in the car and for some reason I was very offended. I mean, I knew that him and his family, that they were Catholic. But it was also the place where I'd felt really loved immediately when I walked yeah. through the door. And so I called him. I was going to go see him anyway. And I said, hey, I'm going to come by and see you. Have you ever heard that Catholics aren't Christians? And he's like, I mean, like in high school or something. And I was like, well, I want to talk to you about this. I mean, I've never heard that. Is that true? I'm coming over. <laughs> so that's where it all really started to hit the roof was at that point. Gotcha. <laughs> No, that is funny. Uh, it makes me. We have to have a follow up conversation about yeah. If you only knew the Catholic Church from one movie, <laughs> right? You know what it looks like. <laughs> it is so interesting though the impressions that people have, right? Um, so what what did he think about that? You know, as you guys talked about that. Oh, question. we got. I got to his house, and by the time that I got into his house, he had Googled it. D don't Google that. It's very it's very alarming what you find. So, yeah. I walk in his room, and he's crying. And I was like, what's going on? He goes, well, I Googled it. And he said, there's all this horrible stuff. He's like, they called the, the Catholic Church the War of Babylon. I mean, they think the Pope is the Antichrist. And he's like, they think we're awful. He's like, I just didn't know that. He goes, I knew that there were people that didn't believe what we believe, but I didn't think there was such a great division that they just hated us based on what we believe. And so I remember just sitting there with him. We're sitting on the floor in his room and... And he was like, that's the first time that I think I've ever really entertained the idea that maybe we're wrong. <laughs> and uh, at this point, we really hadn't been dating that long, maybe two, three months at the most. And for some reason, which I look back now, and I'm like, that was the Holy Spirit. <laughs> but I looked at him and I said, you know, we both can't be right. And, and he was like, yeah, I guess so. I was like, I mean, one of us, maybe, maybe we have some, like some of us have some things right. I was like, but we both can't be completely right. Like one of us has to have the, the fullness of the truth. Someone, one of us has to know more than the other. And I said, what if we try to figure it out? And he was like, okay. And I said, I guess, you know, maybe you could come to church with me and I could go to mass with you. And he said, okay. So I must've really liked this guy, <laughs> obviously. And so I just remember leaving his house that night thinking, I'm going to go to mass. Like, that's going to be weird. And very excited to hopefully show him the church services that I had grown up with, but which at that time was, was probably a non-denominational church down the road. So mm -hmm. it was, that was the beginning of kind of the pulling back of the curtain yeah. of what now is my life. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because you, you'd mentioned that in some sense, your, your faith didn't have a lot of substance in terms of a, a, a particular body of belief or praxis. Right. So I'm sure that, that 
plays into what you <laughs> what right. you discovered as right. you begin to scratch the surface. I think there was a little bit more of an openness to yeah. kind of hearing what Catholicism was because I had been so open to every other denomination. Sure. I didn't walk into any denomination with an established tenet of faith. Hmm. I just walked in and said, well, my friends go here and you guys seem happy. Let's go there. And I remember when I was entertaining the thought of Catholicism and learning about Catholicism, going to the youth pastor at the Nazarene church down the road and talking to him about it. No one could give me any answers. They really, it felt like everything that they knew too was from the movie. So <laughs> I was kind of out in the, out in the yeah. middle of the ocean. It felt like without anyone there to help sure. me steer the boat. But, and even my friends, they, they had no idea, no idea what the Catholic church taught other than we need to stay away from them. So it wasn't getting you very far to try to learn about the Catholic church from those who didn't know her, but what did you begin to discover? So one of the first things that I did, of course, was I turned to the internet and, and I said, you know, if I want to find out about the Catholic faith, where do I go? And I Googled, like, learn about the Catholic faith. And one of the first things that, that popped up was this group of CDs that you could buy. It was like a dollar for eight CDs. A and they deal. great deal, right? <laughs> great deal. It had like the um, Seven Secrets of the Eucharist. It had Rome Sweet Home, like the talk with Scott oh, Hahn. Nice. Yeah. And so all of these really great, let me convince you that the Catholic Church is right, mm -hmm. talks. And so I ordered that. And then I listened to all of them probably in two days, which it wasn't, I mean, I don't think I slept during that time. I was just <laughs> devouring it. And then started to read all of these apologetics books. I read Rome Sweet Home. I read a lot by Tim Staples, read a lot just from that, just these people that had converted over to the faith yeah. and needed to find reasonings. And at that point, my husband and I, my boyfriend at the time, of course, he said, we should go talk to the priest at church in case you want to ask him some questions. And so an old Irish priest, Monsignor Caulfield, and we walk into his office and he says, because uh, why why would a man or woman come and speak to a priest is to obviously get married. So we walk in and he's like, so how long have you guys been dating? And we're like, oh, like three months. And he's like, where did you meet? And so Jason's like at, at Southside Pub or whatever. <laughs> and he's an Irish priest. So he's like, oh, you met at the pub. <laughs> That's great. And he goes, three months, though. It's like, you know, Rachel, you cannot awaken love until it's so desires. So I was like, that's not why we're here. It's not why we're here. I said, I really just wanted to come and talk to you about Catholicism. And so I would meet with him once a week and just ask him whatever questions that I had about the faith. And I just remember just being blown away because he had really deep, insightful answers for me. And the things that I really got hung up on were like Mary and confession. Mm -hmm. I just could not get my mind, my mind could not be wrapped around those things. Yeah. I didn't understand, thought the church worshiped Mary, mm -hmm. you know, and I thought the confession wasn't needed. You know, I can, I can confess my sins right here, right now, and, and then I'm forgiven, right? Why do I need to go to a priest? And he would just patiently let me spout off what I thought, and he would give me the response, and it was just a beautiful discussion. Yeah. But there wasn't anyone that was on the other side of that conversation convincing me otherwise. Mm -hmm. And so it really started this, wow, like, I guess we'll really talk about going to Mass. Because it felt like maybe that was going to be the last thing mm -hmm. that I would need to do to find out if this was where I wanted to be. But even still then, it was still very like, I can't even tell anyone yeah. that I'm thinking about doing this. Because yeah. I was just really worried what my friends, what my family was going to think, what my dad, who was a pastor at one point and a missionary, was going to be like, what are you doing? No, <laughs> you can't go down that road. Right. So we'll take a little break there. Uh, we'll come back and, and pick it back up and hear more about how that uh, how that played out, you know, that exploration. Sure. You know, it is interesting because you mentioned that uh, you had approached friends and pastors and there was a real wasn't much firsthand knowledge about the faith, but, right? But there was still this this real worry that they're going to think that I'm I'm leaving Christ, right? Right. right? Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Okay. Well, we'll pick that back up. I wanted to remind uh, the the audience that uh, if you uh, if you are somewhere along the journey to the Catholic Church, if you're just asking questions or you're in RCA ready to jump in, 
or, or you just, again, have some questions that you want answered, we'd love to walk with you on that journey. And if you check out chnetwork.org, you'll find a number of things. You'll find a newsletter designed and made for you by people like you. You'll find a number of resources as well as archives of the Journey Home program and lots of other uh, powerful stories you know, to help you think through this, this question. But we've also got an online community. Uh, we have lots of other people like you that want to pray with you and for you and walk along this journey with you. So check that out at chnetwork.org. We'd love to walk with you as you uh, consider where the Lord is calling you to be. So we'll pick back up with Rachel Bullman here in a moment and hear the rest of her story. See you then. Well, welcome back to the Journey Home program. This is the second half of the hour, and tonight we're speaking to Rachel Bullman, former Church of God, uh, you know, a pastor's kid of, of missionaries, a yes. really amazing story so far. Uh, and her website is rachelbullman.com, and we're going to talk a little bit later about her, her show with Word on Fire, Meet the Bullmans, of which she's a co-host. Uh, but we're going to pick up on your story. I think when we left off, you know, you and your, your boyfriend at the time were ex- exploring the church. Right. You know, you were finding that people, your friends and pastors didn't really know much about it. Right. You're getting some interesting answers from the priest. And so, you know, Mm -hmm. what happens next there as you keep exploring? So we're coming up to Easter Mm -hmm. and my boyfriend, which now we look back and I'm like, wow, you're very sneaky. He's like, oh, you should come to Easter mass. (laughs) So of course that's where like all the bells and whistles are out. You're on your best behavior at the Easter mass. But he goes, you should go to Easter mass with me. And I was like, okay, well, we didn't go to the vigil. We were, went to the, the Sunday morning and I called my one lone Catholic friend that I knew the night before. And I said, I go, hey, listen, I'm gonna go to my first mass tomorrow. He's like, okay. I was like, I need to know what to wear. And he's like, clothes, Rachel, like you just wear clothes. I was like, oh, okay. Like what I normally wear to church? He goes, yes, just wear whatever you would normally wear to church. And then I said, well, what else do I need to know? Anything else says like, do I need to be prepared? Do I need to study anything? And he just laughed. He goes, well, first of all, there's a lot of calisthenics. He's like, you could maybe stretch beforehand. So you're not really embarrassed. He goes, but you're going to be sitting up, uh, standing up, kneeling. There's going to be a lot of that. And he's like, just do what everybody else does. And no one's going to know the difference. And I was like, okay, sounds good. So we got up the next morning. We were late. And you can't be late for Easter Mass. So we're late. And we end up having to sit up in the choir loft mm-hmm. in the very back. And... I remember just sitting through the mass. I couldn't see anything and I couldn't, I couldn't see over the balcony. I'm not very tall. So there wasn't a whole lot of me being able to really witness anything visually, but I could hear the beautiful hymns that were were saying that morning. There was some chanting. I could smell the incense. I heard the clanging of the, them doing the incense and everything of the thurible. And when we left, we got in the car. It's probably a 10 minute drive between the church and his parents' house. And we were going back there for, for Easter. And I didn't say anything. And so we pull into the driveway and he's like, okay, so, I mean, you hated it, right? Like, what, are you okay? It's like, are we about to break up? Like, is this the end? And, and all I could say was, this is home. Like, this is what I've been missing all of this time is home. And, and I think it was really the liturgy that kind of turned the page to me seriously considering that the Catholic church was something to really look into because at this point I had just asked some some very vague questions and just really hadn't really decided I'm going to try to dive in here and yeah. do something serious maybe look into RCIA or something yeah. like that but at that point I had been to church services that were in movie theaters I had been in church services in random fields for like a sunrise service. I had been in church services that were in someone's living room or just so all of these places that they were made sacred by the people that were there, but had not been in the sacred space of like a Catholic church, just the aesthetics of it, knowing that you're in a Christian place. I had really kind of been raised in this, the the fact that any space is made holy, even if there's nothing in there that's holy about the room. We could be in just a warehouse with nothing on the walls, with no pews, and this is just made holy because we're going to call down the Holy Spirit, and this is this is how it's going to happen. But I had never really been in a place that was aesthetically mm-hmm. holy, except for that first time that I'd gone to Mass, and that was home. Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting. So the, the liturgy, 
I mean, even for Catholics um, that haven't necessarily experienced that awakening, mm -hmm. right? What's the big difference in, in liturgy? Uh, an analogy I've heard, I, I don't know if this applies to your experience or not, but uh, right, we have kind of the fire, right? The fire of, of, our, of our worship, of our desire mm -hmm. for God and all that. Um, what we have in the church is we kind of have the fireplace. Like it gives us the context, it gives us the form right. into which to pour our hearts. And you kind of need both. Is that, would you say that that's part of what you found there? Is that in the liturgy we have sort of a, a place for our worship to take root, to be right. home there? Right. And I mean, at that point I had kind of, I was going wherever the wind would take me. Sure, sure. So I had no place where I felt like, I mean, I'm getting fed, quote yeah. unquote, you know, on, on the Sunday or whatever service I'm going to. But there was no obligation mm -hmm. to go to any church service. There was no, there wasn't a continuity anywhere in my whole life. Yeah. And so to be able to walk into the church and knowing, even knowing the fact that maybe half these people didn't go to church the rest of the year, but they came there because it was Easter Sunday, still made me pause and go, well, if you're going to come here once a year and it's the one thing that you're going to make sure you're not going to miss, that's, that's huge. Mm -hmm. And there weren't a lot of Catholic churches in town either. And so at that point, there was a church on every corner. We have a church that's called TBA, literally like to be announced because it was the, it was two churches that came together and they didn't know what to name the church. So it's TBA. So there were so many churches that you, they ran out of names. And, but there was this one Catholic church that was like in the center of the downtown area. And that's where I went to my first mass. And I remember just thinking, what is going on here? This feels like where I'm supposed to be. Yeah. And at that point, I decided to start looking into RCIA. Mm -hmm. And so we had previously kind of entertained like, oh, if you ever decided to do that very casually, you could maybe go with my mom. My husband was like, you could go with her and maybe see what you think. But I knew that because of my involvement in various churches around the town, that there was a chance that I was going to run into someone that I knew. And I also didn't want there to be any connection to my boyfriend. So I didn't want to go to the church that he grew up in. I didn't want to go with his mom. As much as she loved me, I knew that I wanted to make sure that I was really doing it for myself. And so I went back out to the internet and looked up RCIA and I found this church that was probably an hour, hour or so away from my home. And I called and spoke to the faith formation director, Sharon. She has her phone and she goes, yeah, um, you want to learn about RCIA? Where are you? And she goes, you're like an hour or more away from here. And I was like, I know. I just really want to, to come and see. And she goes, well, you know that if you decide to do this, this is like a weekly commitment for a year. It's like, yeah, I mean, that's fine. And so she's like, oh, okay, that sounds great. So I went to my first view and I was really all in after we talked about Mary. Hmm. So after we talked about Mary and just talking about... Um, basically that she, she was just this archetype of the female, of just the, the church, of the human person really for us, other than Jesus. I had never given her a place. And I remember going home that night and I watched The Passion of the Christ. Hmm. And it was the first time that I'd ever seen her. I had watched that when I was Protestant and just completely glazed over her whole presence in the entire movie. Yeah. Didn't even know she was there. So I'm going back and now with this Marian understanding, I'm going to go and watch The Passion and just being completely, I mean, my mind was blown. Like, she's been there that whole time. Did they remake this? Like, is this the Catholic <laughs> version? Or maybe I watched the <laughs> Protestant really version so. before, oh. right? <laughs> and so after that, I had really decided. Now, the other part about this is, is that when I decided to go to this church and start RCIA, I did not tell my boyfriend. Hmm. So he thought that I was going to a church Oddly enough, it's called Faith World at that time. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a like an amusement park. But it was in or Orlando, an hour and a half away from me. And he thought I was going there every week. It happened to be on the same night that RCIA was taking place. And I did that for probably two to three months. And finally, the night that I had become convinced that I wanted to become Catholic, I called him on the way home. And he was actually off in medical school. And I said, hey, I need to talk to you. I just can't do this anymore. Probably not the best way to start a conversation <laughs> with someone that you're dating. Cause he said, well, I mean, I know we haven't seen each other in a while. Like what's going on? And I said, uh, I was like, no, 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 no. I'm going to become Catholic. <laughs> and he's like, wait, what? How's that happening? He's like, well, I've been going to RCIA 
And so one of the rights, you know, in the very beginning, you have like the right of sending. And the, so I was like, one of the rights is coming up and I wanted you to be able to come. And he's like, I mean, there was a lot of silence on the phone. He goes, are you serious? I was like, yeah. And so I remember when it was approaching and during this time, I mean, this is, this is like August, September that I'm telling him. Mm-hmm. And so we still had to get through Advent to get through Lent before I could come into the church. And I remember when he would leave to go to like the liturgies or to go for reconciliation during Advent and during all of the Lenten liturgies dying on the inside, Mm -hmm. because I wanted to be able to fully participate, not just go to confession, but I just had such a longing for the Eucharist at this point. And I would sit in that we'd go to mass and I would sit in the pew and just cry. I wouldn't even, I couldn't even have the courage to go up because I felt like maybe I'm going to tackle this guy and try to steal the Eucharist. (laughs) That probably wouldn't have been the best way uh, to make my impression of the Catholic Church. But I remember finally going to to Father Caulfield, who had been helping me along all all this time. And I just said, you know, I need to I need to receive Jesus sooner because I had already been baptized. So you had to be brought into the church by the bishop. Mm -hmm. You couldn't go to the local parish to get your first communion on Easter vigil. You had to come in with the bishop. And I was going to have to wait another like two weeks or something before they were they were able to schedule that. So it's coming up on Easter and I'm dying. I'm like, there's no way I'm going to make it two more weeks. And he's like, Rachel, he's like, well, you have to have your sponsor. He goes, can you make your sponsor? Can you, will your sponsor come over here? And my sponsor was actually a convert as well. He had converted over from Presbyterianism. And so I said, sure. And so I called him. He's like, yes, I'll come. And so I came into the church in 2008 at the Easter vigil. And whenever I went up to receive, I couldn't even do the amen response. Like when it's like the body of Christ that I was supposed to say amen, I couldn't even get past my crying. And finally, I think either the sponsor or the, the priest who was assisting was like, Rachel, amen. Not that I couldn't have received without the response, but it was of course part of, part of the liturgy. And I just remember, well, this is it. Like this is, this is where I've been meant to be my whole life. And not only that, just the full circle moment mm. of the fact that the Philippines is so widely Catholic. And what a surprise that I would come all the way back to my roots. And right before I had really decided and knew that I was coming into the church, I had gone to see my dad. And my mom was always very accepting of of anything that I had really felt called to do. So she didn't have any, any kind of qualms about it. But my dad, I was really scared to tell him. And I remember he's also a mechanic now by traits. So we're like standing in like his, his, his lot with all the broken cars around us. And, and I just said, dad, I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to join the Catholic church. And he didn't make any eye contact with me. I looked at the ground and he just, he said, well, that's weird. But he had <laughs> nothing else to tell me, nothing else to tell me at that point. And I remember he did, I begged him to please mm-hmm. come to me receiving the first communion and coming in yeah. into full communion with the church. He did. He came. Uh, One of my friends told me, she said he didn't look very happy the whole time. And so now, you know, we've gone from where we, there were a lot of Catholic jokes, you know, when I first came into the church. And so we'd be sitting around and I was the butt of every joke at every, every family gathering. Oh, well, you know, Catholics do this. And Rachel became Catholic because they have parties for everything, you know, which we do. We, we like it. So, (laughs) and he just, it went from me being the butt of every joke to now, well, I'm going to defend Catholicism because my daughter really does love it. Mm. And she does find truth here. And so even sitting around, I remember one night I was sitting there and my grandmother, his mother asked me, so you just don't believe in Jesus anymore, huh? (laughs) You only believe in Mary. (laughs) I'm glad you brought that up. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, and one of my sisters was like, that's not what they believe. And and they're not Catholic. So she's just going to defend me and knows what I believe based on how I was living and the things that they know that I report now. So it's been a really beautiful journey. Yeah. Well, that's beautiful to hear the continuing grace throughout your family. And tell, tell us, how, what's the rest of the story with you and your, at that point, still boyfriend? I mean, yes, yeah, still boyfriend. Yeah. And so right after we got married, we both started to kind of help with the young adult ministry at church. And during that time, we had a seminarian who was on his pastoral year there. And he said, well, if we really want to be grounded in some really strong formation, we should read church documents. And, and so he would bring in 
this, all the church documents that you're sure going to see during Vatican II, a lot of the encyclicals that were from JP II and Ratzinger, and he would bring in writings from Gordini, Romano Gordini, and just this school of thought that I had never, ever been exposed to. And that was kind of my first theological understanding. And, and I just remember th being kind of overwhelmed like, what is happening? And I said, well, where is this stuff? And I remember him laughing at me. The, the Samaritan's like, Rachel, you could just go to the Vatican website. Like, it's all there. I was like, what? And he's like, yeah. And there's the catechism. And so this is much later and still yeah. me not even understanding the depth of the wisdom that's in the church and that it's so readily available. I mean, I had no idea all these denominations I had grown up in, what the tenets were, because you'd have to do some pretty intense research to find yeah. it. It wasn't yeah. all gathered in one place. And so then a little bit later at this point, I'm, and you know, when you convert, there's a, this huge longing to do apologetics work. And you're like, you're, you're reading all of the apologetic stuff. Right. And so I'm doing that, but there's still, it just feels like there's this other, whole other part of my brain that hadn't quite been activated yet. And so a few years later, I had started to read a little bit of Theology of the Body and, and just the Wednesday addresses, you know, I hadn't really started reading anything else. And so somebody sent me a, an ad that had come up on Facebook and it was for a philosophy seminar that was happening at Franciscan with the Hildebrand, Hildebrand project. Yeah. And so that year, the thing was love, sex and the human person. Yeah. And I remember looking at it, like a philosophy seminar. I'm not a nerd. I'm not going to go to the <laughs> philosophy <laughs> seminar. <laughs> And uh, so it's like, I'm totally going to sleep the whole time. Why would I go to that? And so I look at the thing, the ad, and I, I clicked on the page and it said, you know, this is for anyone, like no matter what kind of exposure you've had, just come. If you've never read any of this stuff, come. I was like, oh man, fine. So I talked to my husband and he goes, oh, you should go. You should go check it out. And it was a whole week. <laughs> and so something just happened. I mean, it felt like. Like that, you know, if you watch a superhero movie and that, that superhero gets powered up, it felt like that. Like yeah. this is like a whole breakthrough. And so I started reading. I went back and read Love and Responsibility. And, and I just remember thinking, what is going on? Like who, a pope wrote this? Like, I mean, who is, what's going, this is nuts. Yeah. And it still felt like the greatest secret I'd ever been told. And that's something that I love about the Catholic Church. There's all of these great thinkers and when you read it, you're like, why is anybody telling other people about this? Like, why is not I on a plane ride one time right after this, this part of my brain that was philosophical had been woken up. My husband's like, what, what book are you going to take on the plane? And we were, it was probably a, a five, six hour ride. And he goes, you should take up Joseph Pieper. Yes. <laughs> and I remember thinking, well, what book? What Joseph Pieper book? And he goes, oh, he's like, I've heard things about, and he hadn't read it at this point. He goes, I've heard things about like this leisure book. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, okay. So I, I took it and he's like, I mean, you're not going to be able to finish it on the plane, but you should take it anyway. I read that thing cover to cover on the plane ride. And I remember I landed and I called him immediately and I was like, oh my gosh, this book. And he's like, Rachel, what is going on? I was like, I don't know. I was like, I can't stop reading this deep thought. And then I remember later looking at the, the encyclical fetus at Ratio, mm -hmm. just, and thinking his illustration there is JP2, right? He says, or was it Ratzinger? Gosh, this is a quiz. Uh, JP2. Yeah. So he says it there that faith and reason, it's like this, the, the two wings of the bird. Yeah. And so if you don't have both wings, it's never going to fly straight. And I really felt like I had been made a bird over and over again, a full winged, two winged bird by the church that I had had all this spirituality and then I was able to really ground it in the liturgy. That's interesting. Because that's one thing I was gonna ask you about is, is sort of this question of if, if we look now back over the whole of the story, you know, what are, what is the thing or some of the things that would say sort of fulfilled what was, what was missing or completed what you, what you uh, were yearning for or lacking? And it seems like that that's a big piece of it here that our, you know, that our desire, our worship has to meet with the kind of the objective, the concrete thing where it's formed and it's given context. And you right. were finding some of that in the, in right. the reason part, right? Yes. And I mean, 
I had, I knew that I had all of this, like, you know, they say, be, be ready, St. Paul, be ready anytime to be, to tell your testimony. Yeah. And, and I was ready for that. I could tell you all day long my own experience in, in encountering God and encountering Christ. But I didn't have anything that would then rationally convince someone of his existence. Hmm. I couldn't sit here and talk about the wonders of the human person in an anthropological sense. Yeah. I could talk about it according to what I had experienced on, in my own. And so I remember for the first time learning that that there were different meanings to words. Like the way that I talk about being subjective or something being objective mm. is different than the way JP2 talked about it when he talked about it in Theology of the Body and in uh, Love and Responsibility. And there was just this huge opening. It was like an abyss. And instead of being really cautious, I just kind of jumped <laughs> right in there. And so at our own home now, you know, I have six kids now. My husband was just ordained to the diaconate. And we like to joke that we had to learn to love it because we're raising philosophers. You know, all kids are great philosophers. And my kids always have the best philosophical questions when they're supposed to go to bed. And so we had to be prepared for really amazing bedtime stories. And that's mm -hmm. where it all comes from. But I'm never going to be exhausted of trying to search and know everything that the church has to offer. And I'm telling you, she's not ever going to be exhausted in teaching me. Yeah. And it's been... It's been pretty amazing to have things that I knew of when I was Protestant be completely, they don't disappear right. within Catholicism, but they've been made expanded mm. and just made whole within Catholicism. So my understanding of, of the Bible and being able to see, that, see it lived out and participated in through the liturgy, participated in the life of the church and her sacraments. But... Mary, of course, was the, the huge thing for me when my, and then the other part was the priesthood. When my husband and I were dating and I was going in RCIA, he told me, he said, I think I'm going to, if we're not going to be married, I'm probably going to be a priest. I was like, what? <laughs> and so I got in the car that night and just cried. And I remember praying to me like, Lord, I mean, this is really rude and I can't, <laughs> I can't compete with you. So if you happen to be calling him, you have to call him far away. Like, mm -hmm. I can't, I can't do this. And then the Lord and all of his humor, I got to RCA that night and sit down and, and Sharon was like, oh, so tonight we're going to talk about the priesthood. And I was like, oh gosh, like I <laughs> cried the whole class. And my sponsor was very confused. He's like, are you okay? Do you hate priests? I was like, no, I just, <laughs> you know, I might lose my boyfriend, but it's fine. But I just remember understanding, you know, growing up Protestant too, Anybody could be a pastor, you could be a, a bishop, anybody is, if, if you say that you're called, no one can challenge you mm. in that calling. You can say, I, I've been called and anointed to do this and nobody else is allowed to tell you wrong right. because that's blaspheming the Holy Spirit, you know, growing yeah. up. And so to learn about the succession of Peter and to learn about the apostles in the church it was pretty mind blowing. It's another example of right how our again our our there and you brought up the words subjective and objective. So let's use those for a moment. Like we, sure. we need a faith that brings those together. Mm -hmm. You know, not that simplifies it to one or the other. Like we we have our relationship with Christ, our understanding, our desire, our passion. So that's on the subjective side. What what's happening in me? But it has to meet with something objective right. where it's formed and broken and reformed. Like we need those both. And so even you give the the example of uh, Catholic view of discernment and vocation, right? There's both sides of that. You you come to the church with a desire and a sense of call, but then that has to be interpreted and confirmed by the church, right? right. We have both sides of that, and that is very different than often uh, the way it plays out elsewhere. Right, and then the other thing that was really kind of that subjective and mm -hmm. objective that I could go anywhere to any Catholic church, and I'm going to experience the same mass. Yeah that someone on the other side of the world is experiencing. And I remember that just blowing my mind. Mm -hmm. Like now this, this relationship that I have with Christ has now been, it's mine, but it's also all of ours. And so everything that I do is now part of this, this family and this church that's truly universal. And it's no longer something that's only isolated to my own understanding, my own, own interpretation, my own experience, but it's also something that's, that's expanded by everything around me. Yeah. And wow, I was really missing out. It was a really beautiful relationship that I had growing up, but 
the beauty that there is now is something that I never could have even prayed for, but the Lord gave it anyway in all of his graciousness. Yeah, the different senses in which the church is Catholic, universal, mm -hmm. you know, one as you were just describing in terms of, again, our, our, our individuality as part of the body, but as part of the body and all that, but even too, again, going back to the philosophy, um, it's Catholic in the sense that there's nothing out there that we have to be afraid of. There's no part right. of reality we have to shy away from. We can, we can embrace all of it, bring it in, interpret it, uh, integrate anything that's true and good and beautiful. We can we can embrace and, and bring it in and understand. We can bring in reason, mesh it with the faith, and and figure out where it fits. Right. Okay. Yeah. And that was it. I remember sitting in the in the office with with Father Caulfield, and he said, Rachel, he goes, you know, have you ever you ever decided to trace those churches that you've you've kind of grown up in? It's like, what do you mean? He goes, well, you know, like you've said that you've gone to a Nazarene church, you've gone to Church of God, Assemblies of God. You've been in, involved with the Baptists. He goes, so if you go back and you just trace every single one of those, where do you find their home? And I was like, well, I mean, they all believe in Jesus. He's like, no, Rachel. <laughs> He's like, I need you to think a little bit harder because I need you to look at. And so he, I can't even remember the book, but he brought it out and it just said basically that all, um, all roads lead to Rome. He's like, everything began there. And if we look hard enough, I mean, I, I was just continue even to this day to be blown away by the fact that everything leads me right there to Rome. Yeah. Well, we've got about four minutes left. Bring us to the present. What, what, uh, what are you working on now? What, where does this journey continue to lead in your life and your journey? Sure. So for us, the, the intellectual life is a huge thing, but it also very inter it intersects with our family life. Yeah. That I remember growing up and like you, I, my family's divorced and being uh, adopted and just all of these different families coming together. I really wasn't sure what my family life was going to look like later. And when I found my husband and we started to have children, we realized that, wow, it's really possible. Like we can be, have this huge family and still be completely happy, completely overjoyed that there's no part of me that's lost mm -hmm. by being a wife, by being a mother. And so one of the things that's been so beautiful is to be able to share our family little snippets of it in, in this series on Meet the Bullmen so they can see. It actually was shot right before we had our twins. Oh. And so they see us preparing for expanding our family even more and that we're really authentically happy. I know that you people hear that and they're like, yeah, right. <laughs> even sleepless and mm -hmm. sometimes stressed with trying to get everybody in the car or off to Sunday Mass, we're happy. Mm -hmm. And just this this realization that life's not about me, man, that's, that's really where our life is right now. It's being poured into them, these opportunities to share about that. And then the intellectual life, it still continues to be something that I never had growing up that I want every young woman to know that is there for them. And so yeah. just recently released a book about that and, and continue to just allow the Lord to call me and hopefully a door open so I can continue to do work for him. What's the name of that book? Uh, it's called With All Her Mind, okay. An Invitation to the Intellectual Life. Very cool. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, a, on a recent episode with um, Lauren, I can't remember her last name here, but we were talking similarly about that, that it's such an important ministry in the church today mm -hmm. to help people catch the vision that uh, family life and my relationships and these things, they're not stuff I kind of put up with on the side and then I, I go do important things out there. No, it's actually in them. That's where I, right. it, that the adventure just begins, you know, and it's a whole, it's a holistic adventure, you know, and so yes. it's, it's, uh, it's my, my whole person and intellect included, like we continue to be philosophers in this, right. in this basic way. We were talking about that before the show a little bit, that everyone's called to be not an academic philosopher necessarily, right. but people are. But in the sense of, of searching for the truth, you know, and going deep into the questions, uh, allowing ourselves to be transformed by yes. the reason and the faith, like we're all called to that. Right. right. Yeah. So good. All lovers of wisdom. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Rachel, thank for sharing you. your story. Thank you so much. For your work. Uh, and thank you for joining us for this episode. I pray that uh, Rachel's story uh, was inspiring to you. And again, if you, if you're someplace on a journey, I mentioned this, uh, over the break that, um, we'd love to walk with you. So check out chnetwork.org, sign up for our newsletter there. And if you have a story to tell, then we'd love to hear it, you know, send that to us there as well. Now the, the power of stories, we need the, the objectivity, we need the truth, we need the, the doctrine, we need the content, but we also need to see it lived out in someone else's life. We need to see the gospel take flesh in a person's life. And then we need to find that in our own life. 
you know, so discover your story and be sure that you're sharing that with the people around you. So once again, thank you for joining us for this episode of the Journey Home program. God bless you. We'll talk to you again next week.